call the attack a surprise is a bit misleading. For weeks, there had been signs. German Nazi spies and defectors who'd crossed into the Soviet Union had disclosed some of the details. Aerial reconnaissance revealed heavy troop movements. British and American officials shared intelligence reports indicating that an invasion was imminent. Even Berlin's ambassador to Moscow seemed to tip the Nazis' hand. Still, Joseph Stalin dismissed all the warnings. He believed that the reports arose from a British disinformation campaign to bring the USSR and Germany into conflict. But Stalin was mistaken. Some 3.9 million enemy soldiers, as well as 2,800 tanks and 5,000 aircraft, stood poised along the Soviet Union's western border. And just after 4 a.m. on June 22, 1941, the largest land invasion in history was underway. German tank and infantry units steamrolled into the Baltics, Belarusia, Ukraine, and Russia itself. Artillery shells fell on Soviet communication systems, and Luftwaffe bombers hit Soviet towns, troop encampments, and airfields. Stalin was dumbfounded that Hitler had double-crossed him and violated a non-aggression pact that the two countries had signed less than two years before, and he was slow to react. Hours passed, and still, the Soviet dictator issued no orders about how to meet the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht. A few years before, Stalin's purge of his own Communist Party had decimated the Red Army High Command. Most of his military officers had little experience leading troops or formulating strategy. Fewer still had the nerve to risk arousing the disfavor of the Soviet leader. No one dared issue an order that might run counter to what he wanted. Consequently, German blitzkrieg forces steamrolled across the country. Within three days, the Germans had moved 100 miles into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And when Fa Stalin finally collected himself, he ordered his troops to attack instead of calling for the tactical retreat that was needed. By the time World War II came to a close four years later, the Soviets would lose 27 million men, women, and children out of a total population of 200 million. Hitler equated Bolshevism with Jewish influence. The presence of a few Russian Jews within the Bolshevik leadership was enough to convince the German leader of an international Jewish communist conspiracy, one that existed only in his mind. Nevertheless, Hitler saw Jews and communists alike as existential threats to the German race and nation. Beyond his racist delusions, Hitler fixated on Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union for geopolitical and economic reasons as well. The German Fuhrer held colonial aspirations in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. His quest for economic self-sufficiency and Lebensraum for the German people focused on European Russia, Ukraine, the Caucasus, and Poland as living room for Germany. Since Hitler viewed the Slavic people of Eastern Europe as racially inferior to his Aryans, he aspired to colonize the territory for Germany's benefit and to enslave the Slavs or drive them further eastward. The Soviets had adjusted their foreign policy in the early 1930s to contend with potential aggression to the West and Japan to the East. One objective was to reframe the country's relationship with the United States. To do so, the Soviets agreed to open talks towards settling czarist era debts that predated the 1917 revolution and they agreed to not actively spread communist propaganda in the United States. As a result, in November 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt formally recognized the Soviet government and reestablished diplomatic relations that had been suspended but never formally severed since the Bolshevik Revolution. Of course, the debt talks went nowhere, and there's evidence that the Soviets violated the agreement not to interfere in American affairs. So the relationship remained frosty. But the Soviets followed up on the American rapprochement with membership in the League of Nations and a pact of peace and friendship with France and Czechoslovakia. Taken along with closer relations with Britain as well, 
This became known as collective security. But as the decade passed, the West failed alarmingly to contain German provocations. Hitler openly defied the disarmament and territorial terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had ended World War I. And when Czechoslovakia was forced to cede territory to Hitler at the Munich Conference of 1938, Stalin lost faith in the notion of collective security. Now, Stalin replaced his foreign minister, Maxim Litvinov, a Jew who'd been an architect of collective security, with Vyacheslav Molotov, a close ally of Stalin who'd led the purge of anti-Stalinist elements in the Communist Party during the late 1920s. And Molotov and Stalin decided that they could trust the Germans more than they could trust the British and French. They viewed securing an agreement with the Nazis as the best way to avoid, or at least delay, war. On August 23rd, 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact that provided should either be involved in a war over the next 10 years, the other would stay neutral. The Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact was also known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact for the two foreign ministers who negotiated it, including the German Joachim von Ribbentrop. It enabled Hitler's armed forces to invade Poland on September 1st, 1939, without fear that the Soviets would attack from the east. But two days later, Britain and France demonstrated that the time of appeasement had come to a necessary end. The Second World War had begun. While the Soviets remained on the sidelines of the larger conflict, at least for now, a secret protocol in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact gave Eastern Poland to the Soviets. It also recognized Soviet interests in Finland, much of the Baltic states, and in Bessarabia, then part of Romania. So, Soviet armies moved into Eastern Poland, and in November 1939, they invaded Finland. By the summer of 1940, the Baltics, too, were incorporated into the USSR. As Nazi armies swiftly conquered much of Europe, it probably seemed to Stalin that his neutrality pact with Hitler was a stroke of genius. But British resistance unexpectedly colored the Soviet's fate. Hitler became convinced that the British fought in hopes that the Soviet Union would ultimately enter on Britain's side. As a result, Germany made plans to invade the Soviet Union itself. Hitler believed that he could achieve the colonial aspirations in the East by conquering and occupying the Western parts of the Soviet Union. At the same time, he would dispel any lingering British hopes about obtaining Soviet assistance. The German plan, Operation Barbarossa, got underway in the early morning hours of June 22, 1941. By this time, Joseph Stalin had established a cult of personality in the Soviet Union. It rivaled, or in some cases exceeded, that of his predecessor, the Bolshevik revolutionary leader, Vladimir Lenin. After Lenin's death in 1924 and Stalin's consolidation of power over the next five years, this cult of personality demonstrably emerged on the occasion of Stalin's 50th birthday in December 1929. To be exact, I must note that Stalin's birthday fell victim to his own revisionism. There's clear documentation that Stalin was actually born in 1878. Therefore, his 50th birthday was in 1928. But with the reins of power firmly in his hands in 1929, Stalin likely wanted to have a public celebration of himself. A 50th birthday celebration probably seemed more momentous to him than a 51st. So Stalin rewrote his own history. And frankly, it didn't serve anyone to question the revision. Tributes filled the pages of Pravda, the official newspaper of the Soviet Communist Party, and flags and banners bearing the leader's image popped up in public places. Propaganda posters featured Stalin as a calm, loving father figure. Paintings depicted him as an all-seeing leader. When the Germans invaded, most Soviet citizens would have expected guidance, inspiration, and hope from their leader. And yet for days after the German invasion, 
Stalin remained silent. Instead, it was the foreign minister, Molotov, who delivered the news that the country was at war. In a radio broadcast, Molotov's address set the stage for the patriotic dimensions that would define the culture of the war. Molotov didn't revert to tried and true socialist propaganda. Instead, he invoked the victorious patriotic war against the Napoleonic invaders in 1812 as a reassurance to the Soviet people that victory could and would be theirs. The party newspaper Pravda now took to describing the conflict with Germany as the patriotic war. And like Molotov's radio pronouncement, state propaganda wasn't a defense of socialism. Instead, it called on citizens to rally and defend the motherland in the great patriotic war of the Soviet people. And a valiant defense was necessary as Hitler's generals organized a three-prong attack against Moscow, Leningrad, Ukraine, and the Caucasus. The siege of Leningrad was more than a month underway when Stalin finally gave a speech in Moscow on November 7, 1941, the 24th anniversary of the revolution, with the Wehrmacht just miles away by now. Until this time, Stalin had presented himself as the patriarch of his people. But with Nazi Germany threatening to destroy the country, Stalin used language invoking fraternity and solidarity to imply that the struggle against Hitler was one in which all Russians, from the exalted leader to the lowliest peasants, needed to fight together. Stalin addressed the Soviet people as comrades, citizens, brothers and sisters. And he called on his people to defend their glorious motherland. He didn't say a word about class struggle or socialism. Instead, he invoked the memory of the field marshal, Mikhail Kutuzov, who led the Russian defense against Napoleon in 1812. This was much like the response of his foreign minister, Molotov, after the German invasion the previous June. Rather than rely upon socialist propaganda, Molotov too had cited Russia's victory over Napoleon. Stalin was reaching into the past to inspire his compatriots, drawing upon longer standing national and cultural icons than the revolution of 1917 could provide. And for those assembled on Red Square this November day, Stalin also brought to mind the victory of the Russian prince hero, and Orthodox saint, Alexander Nevsky. Nevsky holds a special place in Russians' hearts. He defended Russia against invading Teutonic Knights of the Holy Roman Empire during the 13th century. And even in contemporary times, a public opinion poll I once saw placed him at the top of the list of greatest Russians of all time. His image has been invoked repeatedly by Russian leaders throughout the centuries to lend legitimacy and sanction to their rule. Now, here's an interesting point of cultural context, bringing to mind how fashions come and go, but classics never really fade away. A few years earlier, the Soviet filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein had responded to rising tensions in Nazi Germany, which Eisenstein believed threatened instability, even then, with a cinematic portrait of a medieval prince who could prepare every man, woman, and child to meet any war with a sense of optimism. This became his 1938 film, Alexander Nevsky. And it was packaged with a rousingly patriotic score by the Russian composer, Sergei Prokofiev, who recently had returned to the Soviet Union after living abroad for two decades, mostly in Paris. The good-looking and charismatic actor, Nikolai Cherkasov, appeared in the leading role and the movie provided, in the words of the late Georgetown University historian Richard Stites, a composite portrait of the Stalinist hero of the 1930s. Stern, brave, fair, and at one with the people. It seems that the 13th century played well in 1938. A few months later, when the Soviets and Nazis signed their non-aggression pact in 1939, Eisenstein's film quickly faded away 
The analogy between medieval Teutonic invaders and the Nazis seemed too obvious and undiplomatic given the recent agreement between the two states. But fortunes changed again just two years later. With the German invasion, Alexander Nevsky returned to movie screens. For a while, it looked like the Soviet Union would go the way of Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, and quickly succumb to the Nazi onslaught. In the autumn of 1941, German forces advanced more than 1,000 kilometers. German officers could see the golden domes of the Kremlin through their field glasses. The city of Leningrad was under siege, and Kiev had fallen. But Soviet forces successfully defended Moscow and imposed extraordinary losses on the Nazis, who now began to experience delays they could ill afford. On December 6, 1941, the first Soviet counteroffensive began. It would take another two years of brutal fighting, but from the summer of 1943 on, it was the Soviets who took the initiative. In the words of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Red Army tore the guts out of the German military machine. Still, the toll the Soviets paid was enormous. Almost one out of every seven Soviet citizens lost their lives. These weren't merely military deaths. In fact, the civilian casualties were even greater than the military ones. The Russian people suffered tremendously but they persevered. Take, for example, the city of Leningrad, which starved but didn't surrender. The Germans blockaded the city for more than 900 days between September 1941 and January 1944. During that time, residents, without much in the way of fuel or firewood, burned furniture, documents, love letters, and cherished photographs for warmth and cooking fuel. Official rations weren't enough. People starved and froze. In January and February of 1942 alone, about one quarter of a million Leningraders lost their lives. And before the siege ended two years later, between 850,000 and one million civilians of Leningrad had died. At the upward end, that's more than the number of all American and British deaths, military and civilian combined, during the entirety of the war. In such dire times, the Soviet people needed to find a source of inspiration. Stalin and many other Soviet leaders believed that the country's film industry could fill that niche. Broadly speaking, film was a powerful medium for the country in the midst of this great patriotic war. Recognizing this, the Soviet government went to great lengths to protect its movie makers and even evacuated film studios to towns in the interior of the USSR, particularly in the city of Almaty in present-day Kazakhstan. Taking a cue from Stalin's cult of personality, Soviet studios produced films about some of the great men of history, films celebrating Peter the Great, the 18th century military commander Alexander Suvorov and General Mikhail Kutuzov celebrated the historical contributions of Russian leaders of the past and inspired Soviet citizens in the present day. Several of Stalin's biographers note that the Soviet leader had a particular affinity for the 16th century Tsar Ivan the Terrible. In late 1940 or early 1941, Mosfilm engaged the Soviet director, Sergei Eisenstein, to write and direct a film celebrating the life of the notorious 16th century Ivan IV. Eisenstein was still writing it when the Germans invaded. He finished the production in Kazakhstan. Sergei Prokofiev joined him there, and the two reprised their collaboration from Alexander Nevsky. With even more impetus to rouse the patriotic Russian soul, Prokofiev's score used Russian folk songs, liturgical music, and epic choral works. The actor, Nikolai Cherkasov, once again served as leading man. First part of this two-part film, Ivan the Terrible, debuted in 1944 to great acclaim 
the depiction of a strong leader who defended his country from a foreign threat and vanquished his domestic enemies through whatever means necessary resonated with Stalin. The production won the Stalin Prize first class. However, the second part, completed in 1946, showed the Russian Tsar as a more conflicted character and did not pass muster with the Soviet dictator. Stalin derided the work. It was quickly locked away and not shown publicly until 1958, by which point both Stalin and the filmmaker had died. While Stalin cultivated in film the prominence of the great men of Russian history, women had a role to play as well. This was especially the case in screen depictions of female partisans. The 1943 film, She Defends the Motherland, is described as the canonical movie of the war years by Denise Youngblood, a University of Vermont scholar of Russian cinema. In this film, subsequently released in the United States as No Greater Love, we see the heroine Pasha pulled from her idyllic pre-war life after the brutal murder of her family by the Germans and her transformation into an avenging angel. Calm, confident, and willing to sacrifice herself, Pasha exacts revenge, driving over her child's murderer with her own tank while inspiring a band of partisans to fight at all costs. A similar scenario is portrayed by the Soviet director Lev Armstrong in his 1944 production Zoya, based on the life of Zoya Kosmodemskaya, an 18-year-old Soviet partisan tortured and killed by Nazis. The film presents our eponymous heroine as bravely reassuring sobbing village women that she's happy to die for Russia, even as the noose tightens around her neck. The late Georgetown University historian Richard Stites said that the women portrayed in these films represented the innocence of the violated and martyred Mother Russia. Yet, they were far from passive victims since they showed themselves ready to fight to the death. More than any other art form, cinema stamped the image of the Nazi beast and the Russian martyr deep into the national consciousness. Other artists also found creative voices in the midst of war and national turmoil. Anna Akhmatova, one of Russia's great poets, focused on translation work during the 1930s as a means of self-preservation amid Stalinist repression. But the Great Patriotic War unlocked her voice. In the 1942 poem Courage, Akhmatova intertwined sacrifice, resilience, and cultural patriotism. She invokes Russian nationalism and vows that she and her compatriots would defend their language and culture against the German invaders. Her expression of defiance is meant to arouse her fellow Soviets to follow her example. Here, Akhmatova captures what poetry and the Russian language itself meant to the people. You see, Russians took solace in their language and in its power to evoke emotions and a sense of national spirit. Once inspired, they vowed to defend their nation, whatever the cost. Poets and dramatists alike reached large numbers of the public through the radio. In Leningrad, during the brutal years of the German blockade, radio played an especially important role. The Soviet poet, playwright and journalist Olga Berkholtz became a model of perseverance for the nation. In her poem, Conversation with a Neighbor, the poet describes the citizens of Leningrad as suffering from insufficient bread rations with frayed nerves brought on by protracted air raid alerts. Reading aloud on the radio, Berkholtz asked, can I endure it? Can I bear it? You'll bear it. You'll last out. You will. She urges her fellow Leningraders to hang on and resist. And the radio allowed her to reach a greater percentage of her fellow Soviets than she ever previously imagined. The Russian pianist and composer Dmitry Shostakovich shared his prodigious talents over the radio as well. 
Weeks into the German blockade, Shostakovich premiered the first two movements of a new symphony in a broadcast from the Leningrad Conservatory. He performed it as a work in progress so that the people of Leningrad knew that even in this dark hour, life continued. Soon after, the government ordered Shostakovich evacuated from the city for his own protection, along with many other cultural figures and icons. As an unwilling exile in the Urals, Shostakovich finished what became the Seventh Symphony, the so-called Leningrad Symphony, by the end of the year. With winter and the effects of the siege deepening, the government set up speakers on public squares in Leningrad to broadcast the entirety of this masterpiece. The composition made Shostakovich a cultural icon in Russia, while also cementing his international reputation. In 1942, Time magazine featured the Soviet composer on its cover, replete with his telltale glasses and a classical military helmet. Shostakovich later confided that the Seventh Symphony was as much a reaction to Stalin's great terror as it was to the terror unleashed by Hitler. In this way, we see that the horrors of the German invasion and the ensuing war gave political cover to artists' grief that had been brewing for years. A sense of common destiny and sacred mission also found expression in the song Svaishinaya Voina, or Holy War. It was written one day after the German invasion and became an anthem for the Soviet people during the Great Patriotic War. Deriding the fascist enemy as an evil horde, the song calls on Soviets to indulge their fury and fight back because this was a people's war and a holy war. Now, in the Soviet state where the government had closed churches en masse and turned cathedrals into museums of atheism, you might think, how strange that sacred sentiment was being invoked. Isn't this a little hypocritical? The short answer is yes. But when did that ever get in the way of political expedience? Stalin saw a benefit in reforging a connection between the Russian state and the Russian church as 1943 progressed. To that end, he permitted the Orthodox Church to reopen a limited number of churches and schools and to elect a new patriarch. In turn, the newly elected, elected patriarch Sergei acknowledged Joseph Stalin to be the divinely anointed ruler of the Soviet state. Stalin realized the effect that traditional Russian culture had on his people, and that the Russian Orthodox Church was a critical element in it. Let me be clear though, this seemingly greater cultural openness had a dark underbelly. As the Russian nation became the surrogate nation for a supranational Soviet man, ethnicities and faiths, faiths became secondary. And in cases like the Crimean Tatars, Volga Germans and Chechens, they were persecuted en masse. Acknowledging this new sense of Soviet nationalism as opposed to internationalism, Stalin replaced the Internationale, which had been the Soviet national anthem since 1918, with a new hymn. It expresses a nationalist sentiment and the influence of both Lenin and Stalin. In the decade that followed the war, the Soviet triumph over Nazism became synonymous with Stalin's supposed genius. Only heroic depictions of the war reached the public domain. The massive number of deaths and hardships on the home front were expunged from the public record for decades. Military memoirs were almost entirely banned. Five years after the war ended, in 1950, the film Fall of Berlin by Soviet director Mikhail Chiarelli emerged as yet another example of the promotion of Stalin's cult of personality. The backdrop to the film was similar to many war films produced earlier in the decade. But the triumphal scene is when Stalin lands in Berlin after the German surrender as a grand conquering hero. And yet, Stalin never went to Berlin after the city fell to Soviet forces. Still, his metaphorical presence becomes seemingly literal and inscribed on the screen. With a grand patriotic score by Dmitry Shostakovich, the film connects the Soviet victory with the alleged brilliant, almost deified leadership of Stalin. In 
military genius and successful architect of victory. The film debuted to commemorate Stalin's 70th birthday, and he adored it, not surprisingly. Chiarelli's cinematic efforts won him the Stalin Prize first class. It would take the death of Stalin for the Soviet government and people to rediscover an official record of the war and to have an opportunity to collectively mourn the lost lives, though. When that happened, the Great Patriotic War was born anew, and it became an experience that not only defined a generation, but also the nation. Not the Soviet nation, per se, but rather Mother Russia. Tied to monumental victories of the past, like Alexander Nevsky's over the Teutonic Knights and the triumph over Napoleon in 1812, the Great Patriotic War now became viewed as the latest in a proud line of Russian heroism and achievement, a victory won not by an individual leader, but by the Russian people, for the people's motherland. <laughs>